<laughs> okay, well, I'm going to um, stop the chitter chatter and go ahead <laughs> and start the meeting officially. Um, so folks, this will be recorded from here on out. And uh, good to see everyone today. We do have enough people here uh, for a quorum, I believe, but let me just double check and count. I know there's uh, quite a few people who might be late today who have let me know ahead of time. Although, Joel, I see you. So I'm guessing the interview panel went well, and thanks for joining. I, I may have to duck out partway through, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> no problem. Okay. I think we are okay. Um, Paula, for your purposes, um, George Grosch um, is likely not going to make it tonight. He has a family commitment. Um, Chanel Probst okay. um, has a work conflict just for the start of the meeting. Um, and same okay. with Ari and same with Catherine. Um, so they should all be joining by 4.30, but let's just mark them abstaining from the vote on the minutes. Okay. Okay. Good to see everyone. I'm going to go ahead and screen share just to go over your agenda for the day. Welcome to your June Hope Advisory Board meeting. Give me just a second, folks. I'm making sure to let everybody in from the waiting room. Okay, Anita and Nancy are joining now too. Wonderful. All right, just some Zoom housekeeping for the folks uh, joining us from the community today. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, type into the chat your name and the topic of the public comment, uh, and we will take the public comments in the order that people type into the chat, and I'll be sure to pause to give um, an opportunity for anyone who's called in to also make a public comment, and that will be after we go over the agenda for today. All right, here is your agenda. And we will do meeting minutes approval, um, a quick update on staff capacity and a few community updates. And then um, Maddie Bean is here today. Uh, she is the coordinator from the Corvallis Street Outreach Response Team. The acronym is also SORT. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about what SORT does, what their policies and procedures are, what their protocols are, how they help folks. Um, and then uh, for the second half of the meeting, starting around five, we will transition so that you all can have a pretty robust discussion about the city of Corvallis's social services funding policy. Um, and it's not to discuss the actual policy itself. Um, that decision making will be up to our Corvallis City Councilors, but it's more to give input to Jan and Charles about the process and the timeline for making this decision based on some um, factors happening in our community right now that overlap with this exact same topic. Um, and myself and Charles and Melissa Isavoran will be sharing some info on that before you have the discussion so that it can be as informed as possible. All right, just a reminder for all the board members and anyone joining in making public comment, um, the culture of the HOPE board um, is kindness and inclusion and curiosity and open-mindedness and respect. Um, and so I'll be sure to remind folks um, if we start to veer away from that culture. Okay, public comment. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and see if there's anybody, I don't see anything in the chat. Has anyone called in today who would like to make a public comment? I don't see anyone as a caller today. Okay, folks, going once, going twice. No public comment for today's meeting. Thank you. Just admitting a few more folks here. Okay, I think we have almost all the board members who I was expecting. Wonderful. We'll go ahead and screen share again so you can vote on your minutes. Uh, so I sent out the May meeting minutes uh, and I did not hear any edits or feedback um, and I reviewed them as well after Paula typed them up. Uh, I think they're accurate. So we'll go ahead and take roll and also approve your meeting minutes at the same time. But before we do that, are there any other edits that any board members would like to make to the May minutes? Oh, Jan. I would just like a comment. Sure, let me go ahead and stop uh, sharing, Jen. I just wanted to say, I thought the 
the minutes were very well done and captured quite a quite a lot, especially with uh, as much as so much is going on. And I do appreciate uh, talent and skill that we have available for that. Thank you, Paula. Round of applause for Paula, who has been doing this for two and a half years now. You are Thank so you. appreciated. That's very kind of you, Jan. Thanks. <laughs> I Pretty would not be able to do this meeting without you, Paula, not at all. <laughs> well, thanks okay, for taking the time that. to say that. Oh, Carol, I'm going to mute you if you have more commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is there a motion uh, to approve your May meeting minutes? Motion to approve our May meeting minutes. Thank you, Jan. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Catherine is going to be a half hour late today, so you can mark her here, but abstaining from this vote. Carol. Approved in here. Ricardo. You know, I haven't seen Ricardo join yet, um, so let's mark him absent for now unless he joins later. Brian. And Brian is on shift right now. Okay, thank you, Brian, great. Cade. Approved. Thank you. Anita. Approved in here. Joel. Here and approved. George has an excused absence tonight. Ari, have you joined yet, Ari? Okay. He let me know he was going to be late tonight, so you can mark him here, but abstaining from this vote. Barbara. Here and approved. Melissa. I thought I saw Melissa Zavorin join. Am I wrong about Sorry, that? Sorry, I was on mute. Okay, I'm here. Then. Okay, and good. I approve. Thank you. Thank you. Bria. Let me check and see if Bria has called in. Okay, we can mark her absent. Cindy. Here and approve. Charles. Here, and I'm going to abstain since I missed that meeting, and I do apologize. Sometimes my day job gets in the way, um, but I do agree these minutes are fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Peggy. Here and approve. Andrea. Here and approve. Jan. Here and approve. Chanel. Here and approve. Reese. I'm here and approve. Nancy. Here and approve. All right, your meeting minutes are passed. Uh, thank you all. Um, we've got some community updates. Um, the ones that I think most of you have heard already is that the county um, has hired or is contracted with a grant researcher and writer and also a project manager. So we have added staff capacity in the past two months to work on implementing your 12 HOPE recommendations. And those two staff members are learning and being onboarded and included in meetings and are starting to take on some more responsibilities. Um, but that, that work takes time. Um, but they are, they're doing fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing and pass it over to Anita um, to talk about the Samaritan Care Respite Hub. Everybody. Anita. Oh, I good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's not only a new computer, there's a new camera and a new audio system. There you go. <laughs> Um, I, I think everyone has heard about it, but I'm happy to review the details. Um, Samaritan began some robust homeless outreach efforts about four years ago, started off small with one person, me, sort of self-starting and creating community connections and working with our patients uh, post-discharge and sometimes in acute care who were houseless and, and brutally deconditioned or extremely ill or acutely injured. And these efforts have grown now to a team of four social workers, and we're part of a, a little branch of Samaritan called the Care Hub, which is nurses, social workers, and community health workers. There's about 16 of us who go out in the communities to homeless shelters and camping sites and people's homes and hospitals and wherever the need may be, and we intervene to increase access to medical care. Sometimes that means we pay for medication, we pick up medication, we look at wounds, we do pill minders, we go to patients' appointments with them. Um, I oversee 
seven medical respite beds in Benton County, 12 in our whole system, hoping to grow to about 20 by the end of the year. And those respite beds are for folks who are unhoused, who are experiencing things like chemotherapy, um, late trimester pregnancies, severe burn and burn recovery, lots of oncology, lots of um, uh, acute injury recovery, like a, a leg issue. I have several patients in respite right now who are post-stroke and are going through rehabilitation. So those beds are meant to be short-term, two to three or four, two weeks to three or four months in order to get, get folks up to speed as best we can. Um, and then of course we work with the community-based partners where we have purchased these beds to create transitional or long-term housing. So here in Corvallis, um, Corvallis Housing First has been so gracious as to offer us beds. We love their team and we work with COI. We've got a couple beds there. Um, and in Albany, we work with Albany Helping Hands and Second Chance Shelter. And we also have some beds um, with Northwest Coastal on um, the coast in Lincoln City. So long and short of it is the team is growing. Our efforts are growing, which means many more touches. I think last year we touched about 137 people and maybe 35 folks got respite. So that's terrific. Um, and we are working with, yay, thanks. We are working with the most marginalized anywhere from Sweet Home to Toledo and back. Uh, and we, again, we are going out to where people are. Now, when you look at the resume of the department, so to speak, we have um, stroke specialists and OBGYN specialists, and we have a, a high level cardiac certified nurse. We have traditional health workers and all social workers are licensed in our department. Um, so it's a nice resume of clinicians who are doing something that's super atypical in healthcare, which means we're not just chatting with people over the phone or in a clinic, we go to where they are. We change the power differential right out the gate by doing that, right? And we are all um, trauma-informed professionals with a whole lot of love and expertise. So that, that's a good snapshot update, I think, huh, Julie? Absolutely, Anita. Happy to answer any questions as always. Does anyone have any questions for Anita about the work that her LCSW and other folks in, on her team do? I'm glad to hear you've expanded capacity because what I heard so many times during the public engagement section of the HOPE uh, recommendations process was, could we just get an army of Anitas? Um, oh. That would be the most helpful. <laughs> um, so yeah. I'm glad that you are growing your team. <laughs> That that's kind. My husband would say an army of Anitas is a nightmare. So, <laughs> but yeah, we're. I think we're doing great. Whole lot of heart. Whole lot of effort. Whole lot of support from the various communities. Certainly from IHN. So I'm feeling pretty positive. Thanks, Anita. It's always great to hear good news and expanding capacity on a topic that can really weigh you down. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if there's no questions for Anita. Um, Paula, can you make sure to mark Ari here and Bria here? They both joined the meeting um, during that time frame. Good to have you both here. Glad everyone could make it. Okay, um, there's a couple other brief updates uh, from uh, two work groups uh, that I am involved in. One is a research work group that's really HOPE board members. And the second one is a data work group that's more out in the community with community provider participants. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Um, for the research work group, and um, Andrea, please listen in, and Melissa is Ivorin and Barbara as well. Um, the only update I was gonna share from your work group right now um, is that, uh, you are looking into FUSE, uh, and we have met with another county that has successfully implemented a FUSE model, and IHN is looking at and exploring um, their capacity to coordinate and implement some kind of care coordination model like this, um, and there will be more to come as we meet with community partners and city and county and CSC on that topic. Anything else, Melissa or Andrea? Not right now. Not for me anyway. 
Yeah, that sums it up, I think. I, I think uh, IHNCCO is really interested in the FUSE model and is a little bit more than exploring. So um, I'm, I'm confident we'll be able to do something in that space. I just think we need to be smart about leveraging all the lessons learned and aligning with all of our partners. And so I, I think that's where we're at at this point. Great. I do not want to overstate your capacity because it's yours to state. <laughs> right. Well, you know, until you sign on the dotted line. And, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other work group uh, that I helped to facilitate and convene, we're calling it the data improvement work group. And it really is coming from your HOPE advisory board recommendation number one, um, that the city and the county need to help facilitate and coordinate data improvement efforts in our community. Uh, and so the data work group has some fantastic news to share. Um, IHN has created a research institute. It's called IHRI, the Intercommunity Health Network Research Institute. Uh, and Paulina Kaiser is their director. And she has done a fantastic job of recent reaching out to OSU's research capacity. Um, and Dr. Mark Edwards uh, helps run OSU's Policy Analysis Laboratory. The acronym is OPAL, so you'll hear it referred to as OPAL a lot. Uh, and they have a lot of interest in collaborating more on the topic of how do we improve and analyze our data on folks experiencing homelessness. And so Paulina worked with OSU um, to put together a letter of intent um, to apply for funding from IHN through their delivery system transformation funding. It's called the DST funding. And that letter of intent was initially approved. Um, and so they're moving forward with putting together a full proposal. Um, and it will be a collaboration between IHRI, OSU's research capacity, CSC, who really holds all of the data on folks experiencing homelessness, um, and then Samaritan's data on um, what is the utilization in healthcare? Uh, what are people's needs um, from a healthcare perspective? So this is a really exciting um, data analysis possibility to look, I believe for the first time really, at least for our community at the folks who are on our homelessness management information system list as experiencing homelessness and how they are utilizing healthcare to really see what their needs are. Um, and so we can have some real estimates of, you know, for example, these are not real numbers. We have 20 people who identify as male over age 65 with such severe health conditions that they need something like assisted living because of hip replacements or uh, diabetes or whatever else. Um, and so it'll give us some real tangible estimates as a community about what the needs are, um, not just from a experiencing homelessness perspective, but from a, what are the healthcare and behavioral health needs of these folks? So that's very exciting to share. Any questions about that? Or Barbara, did I capture that pretty accurately? Yeah, that was a great job, um, Julie. We actually, Polina, Melissa, Egan, Mark Edwards, and I, I'm sorry guys, I'm recovering from COVID, so I sound funny. Um, we we met today and you know we took our 10 second victory lap of you know making it to the next round of funding uh, uh process and then we dove into trying to frame up what the specific aims are going to be the deadline for submittal of this uh, proposal is july so we've got another uh meeting scheduled in a couple of weeks because we want to just you know keep the momentum going great any questions about that uh, possibility for a study. All right. Okay, well, we can go ahead. Um, I, I wanted to open it up uh, to see if there were any other community updates um, to share from our board members. I hadn't heard any, but I wanted to make sure to pause and see if there were any community updates. I see. I, well, we. I guess we all saw the uh, county awarded a Unity Shelter uh, three hundred thousand dollars. Not not too shabby. 
Yeah, that is from the American Rescue Plan Act funds, um, and it's for um, services at multiple different micro shelter sites under the Safe Place program, and also services at Third Street Commons, um, which is the former budget in motel yeah. location. And I really have to credit Andrea and Sean Collins for working so hard to see this through and also our county commissioner Joe um, and Rick Krager, our financial um, director for making sure that um, this process was transparent uh, and also equitable. Yeah, I, um, Andrea is actually pretty good, you know. <laughs> She's great, isn't she? Andrea, what do you want to say? Who thought? <laughs> Carol, didn't I tell you a long time ago? <laughs> I was like, but me, I'm okay. <laughs> Just kidding, everybody. I wanted to give a brief update about that. We were able to access 200,000 in additional funds through Pro Project Turnkey. So we helped match what the county contributed for the operation support for Third Street. And then also, um, you know, so that Unity Shelter can then use that county money to support their operations at Safe Place, which we um, also participate in. And I just wanted to announce that we have selected an architecture firm for the Third Street Commons project. Um, it's a group called um, MWA, so Michael Williams Associates out of Portland. Um, we are super excited to work with them and you'll be hearing more from us soon. I just wanted to point out that the permanent support, the model of permanent supportive housing includes employment support, behavioral health support, substance use um, disorder um, services. Um, so we need partnerships. So I will be contacting folks. And if you want to work with us, if you wanna be proactive about it, please reach out to me. That's it. Thank you for that, Andrea. I think from off the top of my head, the mental health, behavioral health folks we have on the board would be Chanel, Cade, and Anita. Do we have any other folks working in behavioral health or mental health addiction? Okay, great. You know, um, I, I think we don't always honor the, um, the amount of change that's happening in the area with transitional housing and shelter housing. You know, we've spent so much of our energy, not we, cause we're cool, but some people have spent so much of their energy uh, arguing about this and having these big fights that that it get it's not getting noticed how how significant the changes have been you know you still hear people saying well what about this but but if I think about even two years ago I mean half this stuff didn't exist and and when it got talked about it was all seen as a oh yeah sure but but it's a you know the stuff that Anita's doing uh, Andrea's work, Sean's work, I mean, your work. I mean, it's all pretty amazing and it just doesn't get honored. And, and I think we, we on the board should honor the work you're doing because it's, it's, I remember when you interviewed and it's like, why would you want this job? You know, you nuts. <laughs> so, so I just wanna thank all the people who are doing this because I, I'm an observer and, and not a, I don't do the work you do, but I, I uh, you know, I live in this community and I love this community. So it's really, it's really thrilling to me. So thanks everybody. I'll mute myself now. No, thank you for those sentiments, Carol. I agree with you entirely. And I do remember your salty questions when I flew up here for that interview. Why do you want to live here? Why do you want to work on homelessness? I was like, well, okay, let me tell you. Um, so <laughs> And I have good news on that front, Carol. The other added staff capacity that I um, forgot to share again is that our health department has a new communications coordinator, Kaylee Olson, and half of her time has been devoted to working on hope communication. And that takes a long time uh, because there are so many different folks with so many different updates from their organizations and different sectors. We want to make sure we get it right. But Kaylee is probably within a week of finalizing a wonderful progress update um, that really is exactly what you're speaking to, Carol. So many different organizations have done a fantastic job over the past year of adding capacity, adding staffing, adding locations, helping people. We have more emergency housing vouchers to transition families out of homelessness. 
Um, and so we're putting it together in one comprehensive document um, and organizing it by the hope recommendations um, for a couple of reasons um, to show, you know, what are the hope recommendations in action. Um, and these are priorities that the city and the county have accepted. Um, and so when, you know, Sean Collins or Andrea can point to the work that they've done under an accepted HOPE recommendation when they're looking at funders or applications um, or community pushback, they can say, hey, we fall under this HOPE recommendation. It's a priority for the city and the county. Um, and here's where we fit into the system. Um, so it's for a variety of reasons, and that should be ready in the next week or two so that you can share that communication and all the progress that we've made as a community. Yeah, any questions for Andrea about what she shared? Also want to bring folks' attention to Melissa's um, feedback in the chat about celebrating our victories, even when we have a long way to go and miles to go before we sleep. I, one more thing about the project. So it's very important um, that everybody knows that one of the stated goals is to serve those, those um, populations that are overrepresented and underserved in our community. So um, uh, African American community, um, the Latino community, also um, um, Native American. So Native American, as we all know, Native American homelessness rates are really high in our community. So we will be inclu inclusive of, of those groups and really trying to reach out to do a good job of including that, that cultural perspective as we develop the project. But I would love any feedback, any, any information that if you wanna be a part of the project, if you are want to talk to me more about it. Um, I'll, like I said, I'll be reaching out more, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Thank you, Andrea. Would you mind putting your email, your work email in the chat um, for Hope Board members who would like to contact you about that? One last thing I wanted to say, um, we did a lot of work with an equity consultant throughout last year, um, and I always want to make sure whenever data is shared about our folks experiencing homelessness, that we explain the reasons. Um, and so the overrepresentation of folks who are Native American and who are Black, um, that comes from a long history in Oregon um, of racism and discrimination and not being able to own property or being removed. Um, and so those rates um, of overrepresentation in our homelessness, there are reasons for that. <laughs> so I, I always want to make sure that folks don't infer um, negative things about that overrepresentation because there's systemic history that has contributed to that. And the HOPE board members learned a lot about that throughout last year. Okay, any other community updates? One last thing, Andrea, um, I know I reached out to you and Sean about um, hopefully uh, being the educational component at the uh, August meeting about Third Street Commons and Housing First and the work you're doing there. Um, so hopefully if that scheduling aligns, uh, you all will be hearing more about that project in an in-depth way. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and screen share just one last time to introduce our guest speaker. Um, so the Street Outreach Response Team here in Corvallis, it's coordinated by the Daytime Drop-In Center um, and Maddie Bean is their coordinator. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Maddie. How you doing today? Hey, good, thanks for having me here. And well, um, nice to see everyone. I see some familiar faces and a lot of new faces as well. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Your audio is perfect. Do you want to test out being able to screen share? Is it working yes. for you? I was just going to do that next. Wonderful. Um, except, let's see here. Okay, everyone can see that okay? Yeah, just put it in slideshow mode if you can. Yeah, I was just remembering how to do this. Let's see. Okay, now it's in slide, slide mode. Um, all right, so, so uh, Maddie, I'm going to stop you just for one second because we can see yeah. your outline on the right. Do you want it yeah. that way? Um, you can change the display settings. Let's see. You'd think I'd know how to do this. I taught multiple classes. I'm just forgetting which screen it needs to be on. Let's see if this works. Okay. 
Oh, wait, not that one. Sorry, everyone. Give me one second. That's all right. Um, while you are figuring that out, Paula, I want to make sure you mark Catherine and Chanel here. Um, they have also joined the meeting, so make sure their attendance is recorded. Did you mean somebody else, Julie? Um... No, uh, I wanted to make sure you were marked here because I think I said in the beginning that you might be late and oh, I wanted okay. to make sure that you did not get marked <laughs> as not being here. Okay, thank you. Of course. Oh, there we go, Maddie. Your screen is, is perfect. Go ahead okay, and take I the reins. To, I had to flop the screen, so thank you all for your patience. <laughs> Um, okay, so did the check in. So yeah, I'm uh, Maddie Bean, Street Outreach and Response Team Coordinator. I'm going to probably just use the term sort um, from here on out in the presentation. And I'm just going to talk like um, Andrea said, or sorry, Julie said about just what sort's been up to for the year. Um, I came on as coordinator about a little over a year ago, but SORT actually transitioned under the Corvallis Daytime Drop-In Center in February of 2021. Um, and it was under Housing First before that. So um, I, I appreciate outlines, um, just so you know kind of what I'm going to talk about. So I'll do a quick overview of what SORT is, um, some SORT metrics, um, kind of what we've been up to, and just a little bit of data around that. Also, some onboarding um, and training procedures that we do to make sure that our team is, the SORT team is ready to go um, and do quality outreach, um, some policies, and then I will talk about my SORT team, who's an amazing group of volunteers that I get to work with. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about just future directions and goals for SORT. Okay, so we go out and do outreach on Wednesdays and Fridays between 9 and 11 a.m., and that is actually something that I've been able to grow. So before um, before I came on, the sort went out Fridays between 9 and 11, and so I've been able to add a second day, which is really important for multiple reasons, um, just because we don't always reach everybody in one day, um, and also because sometimes some of the things that we're helping folks with or navigating folks through um, requires a quicker follow-up, and so it's really great that we can get there twice a week. We do go at the same time, um, and there's if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to talk through it, but that's we have debated maybe changing up the time, and that could be something we do in the future as well. Uh, we visit various encampments in our community where unhoused people are living. We are mainly reaching people who are living in tents or directly on the street. Um, not as much car or RV, um, people living in cars or RVs, although we have done some outreach there too. And um, there's a lot of goals for SORT, so I'm just going to go over some of the kind of the main ones here. Um, so number one is building relationships and mutual trust with the people that we're visiting. Um, that's really, really important just to, to be able to have real authentic interactions. There has to be a level of, of trust um, and also just mutual respect that's going on. And so that's kind of the cornerstone of what we're doing and just going out every week, multiple times a week so that people know who we are, um, they can see familiar faces. And I've we've also worked to have what I've called the stable teams approach. So I'm trying as much as possible given capacity to send the same people to the same locations every week. Um, and through that relationship we're building, we're able to, to um, basically get to know and learn about people's needs and goals, as well as the barriers to achieving those. And so we're able to, to help break down those barriers as much as possible, make connections um, when that's what's needed, and also um, just kind of understand what's standing in the way for people achieving whatever goal they have that day. Um, we work to also connect people to services. So SORT is a collaborative effort. There's service providers that come out with us from various organizations. Um, and so sometimes those connections happen directly when we're out doing outreach and other times we're on the phone or we're uh, making appointments with people for a different day. But we, we definitely make a lot of connections, um, service connections for folks. And then we meet people's basic needs. So we carry out coffee. That's kind of our foot in the door um, coffee. And actually it was Andy, one of the awesome team lead volunteers that's been with SORT pretty much since its beginning. So most before I got there um, and he started bringing coffee. And so we've now, every team carries coffee and hot water. So we're able to offer oatmeal um, as or soups and things that we can make with some water as well as coffee. And that's just a really great conversation starter, especially because we're often waking people up at nine o'clock in the morning um, or, or just meeting them when their day is just getting started. Um, and then we 
um, help with ed education and support around harm reduction in our community. So we do direct communication. I'm on the phone pretty much every outreach day with Chris Gray, um, Benton County Harm Reduction Specialist. Um, but we also work to educate people on things like overdose prevention. Um, we have fentanyl testing strips. And through our partnership with Chance, we've been able to actually carry out and distribute Narcan as well. And um, we stay up to date on camp postings. So that's been something that I, that was already part of SORT's work that I've definitely um, grown in is just staying up to date on who's being posted, who's being swept, where people are moving to, all of that. Um, and finally, we, I do coordinated entry as well. And I connect people directly back to our needs navigator to, um, to do the coordinated entry process in the VIs for that's with um, Anne is our needs navigator. Um, so I just provided a little bit. So this isn't a full comprehensive list of all the things that SORT has done in a year, but um, but this is just some of the work that we've been up to and um, falling into categories of harm reduction as well as service connections. So as part of the winter warming and safety program, we carried out and distributed fire extinguishers. Um, also, we were trained um, in fire safety and also how to use fire extinguishers. I got to practice, that was really fun. And we then were able to, to educate people as we were giving them fire extinguishers, how to stay safe um, in their tent and stay warm without fire hazard as much as possible and also how to use a fire extinguisher if, if that is needed. Um, I already mentioned we connect with Chris Gray. It's an average two to four connections per week. Um, we give out, depending on the supply, it's anywhere from one to six Narcan um, doses per week that we're giving folks. Um, and that's not us giving them Narcan, it's us giving them the dose so that they have it in case um, an overdose were to happen. And we don't ever just give stuff. We also, like there's awareness building and education that goes with that. So we talk about safe using, never using alone because Narcan is useless if you happen to overdose and you're not with somebody else. Um, and then we have, we were also working really hard with um, educating around COVID-19 transmission and connecting people to the vaccine clinics that happened at the drop-in center. Um, I've listed a bunch of different service connections that we make and are continuing to make on a weekly basis as well. Um, so getting people on the housing wait list. Um, one here, the support with letter writing and section eight application. Even though that's kind of a unique case, it's not something that we do all the time. I was able to help somebody um, basically write a letter to stay on the housing wait list and then get their section eight application submitted. And that's, I like to highlight this example because that person was unable to get to um, the drop-in center in particular and other places away from their camp given physical mobility issues. And so by being able to come to them and get these things completed, it decreased lag time. It also, again, it was kind of a building of, um, of trust with that person and just also getting stuff done, which is really important. Uh, we do phone applications, ride line appointments. I've waited for people to make sure they get on their ride. Um, and then during the holiday time when we had gift cards, we also signed people up for those. And then the pit count. So SORT has, again, before I got there, SORT was already a really integral part of making sure that the pit count, um, that we're counting everybody in the pit count that we can. Uh, so we, this year was no different. We went out. Um, and basically surveyed, it was um, a little bit over 50 people that we were able to survey and, and have them take part in the pit count. Um, and part of the reason that we're so integral is because we have established relationships with people. We, um, some of the hardest reached, hardest to reach people in our community. We also um, are not afraid to go explore new areas and we know kind of where to go as well and then we'll explore as needed. And um, so we visited a total of seven locations. I said how many surveys we conducted. And then that it, it accounted to about three to four teams per sort day. And I'll point out that that's actually, that's just pretty common how many teams we have on Wednesdays and Fridays. It's somewhere between uh, three to four teams each day. Um, there were just a couple challenges that I highlighted here. So there was some last minute receipt of the sampling maps that made it so that a little bit um, challenging to kind of from just a um, like pre-planning and organizational standpoint. Um, Peggy, I see your hand. Just a quick question. I was just curious because people can choose not to participate. Did you have Correct. a lot of people who were resistant to participate? 
not at all. Um, I think I, I know um, most of my team, we were able to do the full survey. And actually I was, there was two people I know that I did a survey with that said, not now, like not today. We tried again the second day. Um, and then we would just do an observation if they didn't want to do the full, but vast majority of the people that we talked with were totally fine doing the whole survey. Yeah. And had no, and actually surprisingly had no issues answering any of the questions that we asked either. Um, and again, I think that uh, that's just a testament to we're not new people coming out there and asking to survey them. Um, and we explained the purpose of it as well, which I will say a lot of people in our community um, who are unhoused are, they were already pretty familiar with it as well. So yeah, not everyone, but a lot. Um, and then the other kind of challenge was camp postings and displacements were happening pretty much right up until the pit count, um, the week that it was supposed to take place or that it did take place. And so there's one area in particular that had over 20 people and then a sweep happened. So people were displaced and it made it so that there was only around 14 people the day that we were trying to, to do that. So it decreased the numbers and that was kind of happening across the board. Um, and so there's already, like I mentioned, communication around maybe how we can work ahead of time to try and troubleshoot some of this for the, the coming pit count. Um, a little more here. I think you'll all learn. I love talking about this. <laughs> I love I love the work that I get to do. Um, but we see between 40 to 60 people each week, and that comes out to, um, on average, 51 unduplicated interactions that we're having, and then 220 total interactions per month. Um, so, and at those interactions, we are giving out basic needs. Um, I don't think I mentioned um, everything yet that we give out, but Coffee, food, um, pet food, socks is really common pretty much year round. Um, we give out winter clothing like beanies and um, scarves and gloves when it's colder. And then hygiene and first aid supplies. And trash bags is also really big. And that's actually a collaboration with Parks and Rec that provide trash bags for us because it's it's kind of the over, a bigger goal of keep helping to keep parks clean and safe. And so they're able to provide those to us to then give out to people and also, again, educate kind of around um, where they can take those bags so that they are picked up and all of that. And then I already mentioned, um, we do stay informed about camp postings and work to support people through camp displacements as much as we are able to. This is an overview of the onboarding and training material that everybody, including myself, including any service providers that come out with us and including volunteers, um, go through before they join SORT. So there's a volunteer orientation manual that just is an in-depth description of the mission and goals um, and protocols and procedures of the drop-in center and SORT. So it's kind of a manual for both because when people are volunteering with SORT, they're essentially a volunteer under the drop-in center. Um, and then there's a volunteer job description and then the volunteer training checklist. And that has um, just a whole bunch of resources that are on kind of the main tenants and topics that we want people to have some familiarity with before they join outreach. Um, so food safety is one, but also things like harm reduction, de-escalation, um, person first language. So these aren't, I always tell people, this is a really, really kind of baseline foundation of just awareness, but you're going to gain these skills and learn a lot while you're actually doing outreach as well. So to keep these in mind, and also especially if somebody is really unfamiliar with something or really uncomfortable with a certain topic, uh, we have additional resources, we have um, experts that we can connect people to, and kind of just make sure that people feel ready and comfortable. Um, but it is a lot of also being adaptable and kind of going with the flow as well. Um, we had a sort wisdom panel a year ago that I'm working to plan another one, and that was really, really cool. There was four experts um, who have done outreach um, that, had, that basically shared their wisdom and insight with us for an hour long conversation. And that was, that was a great opportunity for all of us, myself included, to just learn a little bit more about, about outreach. Um, so the other procedures that I make sure people do before they come out with us is just to chat with me. And so I can get to know them, they can get to know me, um, they can ask any questions they have, and I can kind of give them the lowdown on what to expect. Uh, also, people sign a liability waiver. 
for the first few visits out, um, it, it kind of, I mean, it all depends. Every, some people come with more experience or it's just more in their comfort zone. Others, maybe not as much, but there's definitely kind of a shadowing component where um, new volunteers are just more there to kind of observe, um, still like help with coffee or whatever else, but definitely not take on like a lead role for at least a few months um, until they feel comfortable um, taking on a lead role. And some volunteers, I also have a very open communication policy um, and really work to uphold that so that people feel comfortable chatting with me. But some volunteers don't ever really want to be leads. They just are really comfortable kind of being there to support, um, being there in solidarity, but they don't want to be kind of the, the, the front person of the team. Um, what else? Let's see. We've also provided, um, I've provided a lot of ongoing training opportunities. So these, this is just a list of all the ones that I've been able to provide in this year. Some like the Narcan training we've done a couple of, and these are based on observed needs or just requested needs or things that my team members have mentioned, hey, we could use some more of that. Um, anything that I tend to find useful or helpful, I also just will pass along and share as I'm, as I'm able to with my crew. and policies. <laughs> um, and we're always reminded of these and kind of going over them because um, sometimes it, just situations are unique and you have to kind of be reminded like what, what sort does do and what we don't do. So we don't provide, we're not a transportation service. Um, and I kind of learned, I'll be, I'll admit I learned that the hard way, <laughs> um, but we don't have the capacity and also from just a sustainability standpoint to be able to provide rides to people, whether that's to appointments, but we can form, you know, we can make connections with RideLine and we do that. Um, we also, in like a situation where somebody is has been posted and needs to move, um, we often get asked if we can help and we cannot do that for, for a variety of reasons. So that's one major policy. Um, we also don't make promises. And I would say all of my team leads and members are awesome at kind of knowing that we can't make promises. We all have huge hearts and um, want to fix people's you know problems, but we realize that sometimes those are really complicated and we may not be able to, or we may not be the best equipped to do that. And so we are able to kind of take a step back and maybe say, you know, we can try or we can look into that, or we can connect you to somebody who's appropriate, but we don't use the term, you know, I promise that I'll get you that or get that done. Um, a big one for me is just holding space for others, um, people that we're visiting, as well as um, as well as for ourselves on the team. So that might mean taking a step back from outreach. It also means kind of holding space for yourself and knowing if on a day that you're not feeling it or you're not, um, you have maybe other things going on that it might not be your day to kind of be a lead or maybe even just not being at outreach that day. So that's kind of part of my uh, self-care and that's important for us to practice that because it's something we're trying to also encourage among the people that we're visiting. We always go out in pairs. So we have kind of that buddy system at the minimum. There's always two on a team. Um, and at the most, we keep it to about four. I try not to go over four people per team because that's pretty overwhelming. Um, if you just think of four people approaching you, um, even if you know one of those people or multiple, it still can be kind of overwhelming. So we try to keep teams anywhere from two to four people. Um, and then, I work to, we, we all work to uphold community safety for all. So that includes us um, doing outreach as well as the people, and just as importantly, as well as the people that we're visiting. So we want to ensure that everyone feels safe in a given situation. And if for some reason that safety uh, feels threatened for any reason, or it doesn't feel like it's a great interaction at that moment, then we, we leave um, and we might just move on, or we might leave the area completely. We might come back at a later time um, or connect again, somebody to a more appropriate appropriate person, just given the situation. Um, that doesn't happen all that often, but it has happened before. So just kind of, again, respecting the safety of everybody in the situation. Um, and then last, we also announce ourselves. So that's really big is we're coming up to people who are often intense, who can't see us coming. So I have gotten really good at <laughs> projecting, um, but in a very kind and welcoming way. So trying to, you know, let people know who we are, um, and most people, when they hear sort or when they hear out street outreach, they know who we are already. Um, but if they don't, we introduce ourselves um, and then we just explain why we're there and what we're there to, to offer. 
So currently I was looking at my list. I currently have 24 volunteers on the list, on the sort volunteer list. Um, it has been as high as 30 before. It's summertime. So we've lost some, some um, students that have um, you know, gone away for the summer, but uh, we are, I'm working to kind of grow that back up. And it's kind of this intricate balance of how many is enough versus how many is too many volunteers. Um, and it's kind of always just figuring it out. Um, but we log between 90 and 110 volunteer hours per month. So this is, SORT is primarily volunteer. Um, so that's, I'm the only paid staff person on SORT and I'm uh, part-time, so 20 hours per week. So we absolutely could not, SORT wouldn't exist without all the amazing volunteers. And those hours are only volunteer hours. So anyone who's getting paid, um, whether it's, you know, you're on the clock um, through your other organization, then that's not long. So these are just people that are volunteering their time to come out with us. Um, I mentioned that sorts of collaboration across many organizations. So currently who comes out with us, we have providers from Carvalho's Housing First, from Chance, um, from Unity Shelter. We had people from Easter Seals, unfortunately, um, through other for other reasons that um, has ended for the moment, but hopefully we'll be back um, at some point. And so beyond just the people that come out with us, we're, and we're building that too. So we're um, we were in communication today with people from the county, and we'll have people from the county joining us as well. Um, we have others at the drop-in center, like Samaritan uh, care managers, who are, will either connect with us. I've had them join at times as well. Um, so it's kind of always growing, but these the Carvalho's Housing First, Chance, and Unity Shelter are sort of the, the most consistent on a weekly basis that joins us. And then my team's really diverse. So I have the, the privilege of working with just a diverse group of volunteers who bring their own unique experiences, perspectives, and skills, and that is a huge strength of ours. Um, and what else? So some future directions. I am really excited that we, um, starting in July, are going to be bringing on another needs navigator at the drop-in center, and that person is going to come out on SORT. So part of their time is going to be joining us. This person um, will also be able to do coordinated entry while out doing outreach. So um, that's going to grow and be a major goal um, that we're going to be achieving. So that'll be awesome. Also, we're going to, I'm going to continue the training opportunities. I actually, I'm going to be working to build in one either monthly training or bi-monthly training during the SORT meetings, whether that's for the full-time or part-time of the meeting, um, but that's the direction we're headed. Um, I mentioned, so increased coordinated entry along with that needs navigator. Um, growth and team leads. So I always have people that are um, taking on more of a leadership role. So just continuing to support that. And then also I'm working to plan another wisdom panel with um, the COAT, which is the community outreach and assistance program um, or team in Albany. So that's the outreach team in Albany. So working to make this so that both our outreach team and their outreach team can take part in this wisdom panel and, and be present for that. Okay, that's it. If anyone has questions, I'm really happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, if you wouldn't mind stopping screen sharing so I can see everybody. Um, there was one question in the chat. Um, whenever you do organize the next annual wisdom panel, are there plans to invite law enforcement folks? Because I know that they're doing a lot of work internally on trauma-informed care training right now. You know, that's a great suggestion. And I'm going to add that it, there, I hadn't really thought much about the panel beyond who was on there last year. <laughs> so, but they were not involved last year. So I will reach out. Yeah. Well, and less about them being on the panel and more inviting law enforcement to attend right. so they can hear right. the experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, um, um, we, so everyone was kind of invited at that last one. And I believe there was, there was, um, maybe chief Hurley is on the on the sort list, um, I believe he is. And so that was there, but I'm trying to make it, it was kind of, I wouldn't, I don't wanna say an experiment, but uh, we were seeing kind of how it went and it went really well. And so that's why we said, let's make this an annual thing because I think it is like you're saying, very important for um, just for learning opportunity. Even me, who's been doing outreach now for over a year, I still know that there's so much to learn from, from others. Thank you. And Maddie, you're getting lots of great uh, feedback in the chat that I hope you see lots of thanks. Um, oh, thank you, everyone. Carol, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Oh, Carol, you are uh, muted right now. I'm, I'm thinking that this information should be out to the broader community. 
And I'm always looking, I'm, I, uh, Maddie, I, I'm the housing person from the, from the League of Women Voters. We don't, we don't do services, we're advocating and educating, uh, but I, there's so much misinformation out in the community about who gets served. And, and I often get notes from people saying, Corrales needs to send somebody out and talk to people. And you know, people don't know what we're doing, what you're doing. Um, and I'm thinking that either a, a league program or somewhere there, there should be a, there could be, there ought to be a, a public program uh, just to educate our community that there's a, particularly the statistics you have, you know, how many people you're serving and, and that it is all volunteer and really the impact you're making in terms of, of probably diffusing a lot of tension and maybe anger that people have, that again is not, not appreciated. Um, so I don't know if you or, or if, if Julie, I, I mean, I don't know if this is an idea that, that can go somewhere or not, but all the time you're talking and thinking, this is terrific, this is terrific. People need to know about this. So does anybody, if, if there were a program, do we think anybody would come, I guess is the question. Because the people who do service already know about it. So we'd be talking about the larger community. Well, maybe we should just put it in our back pocket and think about it because I, I feel like there's a lot of information here that would really uh, be terrific to get out there. Carol, why don't I follow yeah. up with Maddie about the best way to transmit some of this information Absolutely. to the league or to the greater community and I can sure. share it with you all. Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And thank you so much, Carol, for what you said. I actually, when I was first joining and going out, I made comments like we should be doing outreach to the broader community, <laughs> to the house community, right? And and kind of spreading the word and also getting just a better feel for sort of people's perspectives and how we might challenge some of those as well. Sure. Um, but we have not done that. But yeah, that's so I mean, any way we can spread the word. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Um, Jan Napak had a question, but she just lost power. So we're going to not answer her question right now and wait till she joins the meeting. Uh, Barbara, you had your hand up. Oh, thank you, Julie. Hey, Maddie. It was good to see you. <laughs> Barbara and I go way back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are doing amazing work. Um, and, and kind of uh, tags on to what Carol was saying, we were kind of thinking along the same lines is, um, in the in the outreach opportunity that we have now because we actually have somebody that does public relations uh uh working in, in judy julie's organization um do you think it would you know in, in the people that you have met do you think that one or two would be willing to be interviewed and be like part of a story so like this is the face of homelessness in, in benton county yeah because i think that that would be really powerful and then the other thought i had was um i i would love for somebody from the local paper to interview you and and have that be pushed out more broadly so if there are community members that are you know frustrated from what they see but they don't you know they're not given the opportunity to you know figure out what they can do they can reach out to you and who knows maybe even volunteer with you so that they can see firsthand uh, what's being yeah done. yeah i love that idea um so in terms of um yeah just having more people join that can learn about this i do love that idea we've had um city council member uh ellis join charlin ellis join us which was really wonderful and so we do invite people to join i still ask for them to do the training materials and all of that ahead of time because one thing that i'm really we we just are conscientious of at the drop-in center in general is we're not doing like tours of poverty right and so we just want to make sure people are are coming who um even if they can't join, I've had plenty of people that can only come once, but it's because it, it is contributing to kind of a larger, their larger work that is still around um, homelessness in some shape, way or form. And also kind of 
we're pretty transparent. So if we have new faces with us, um, then we, you know, we kind of share our stories too. Um, but as far as like people being the faces, we have had, and this is a testament to, um, again, Sort was here years before I got here. So I can't take all the credit for the amazing um, team building and like relationship building that is there. But my, my A team, I say that because his name is Andy, one of the team leads. Um, and he was the first person I went out with and kind of learned like, okay, this is what it looks like when you've been coming to a, a, a community over and over for a year, a couple of years, people really know you, they trust you. And we were able to actually bring in, it was a documentary, um, somebody from OSU making a documentary and they like welcomed us to film, to go into their into their um, camps, into their homes um, and um, and really get like, and, and we just had dinner and sat down with them right where they were and just got life stories. So we get that a lot where people are really willing to share. Some people are um, willing to share, but maybe don't want their face shown or don't you know they, they're willing to share their story but want to be kept anonymous so um, we definitely respect that as well but I know for sure there are people that have shared because we've done sort of life story pieces through the drop-in center as well and um, there are people that have shared with me on outreach that they'd love to 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 share more so that's a great idea too yeah thank you thank you um, Maddie oh sorry Barbara um thank there you. please keep up the great work you're doing amazing work <laughs> thanks absolutely um, Jan had a question um, when you mentioned increased coordinated entry, whether that mm -hmm. meant HMIS data collection and data input or and or uh, broad coordination between other data symptom systems. Um, and Melissa Egan um, chimed in that um, sorts making an effort to do more of the HMIS coordinated entry assessments uh, with their clients. But it does sound like you're doing a lot of coordination with other systems, but not data systems. Correct. Yeah. Yep. You just answered that very well. <laughs> so yeah. So the HMIS data system is really what I'm talking about when I say coordinated entry. I, yes, I coordinate across the board, um, but not through data systems, through conversations and phone calls <laughs> and all of that. Yeah, as well. Thanks, Maddie. Um, Cade, you put something in the chat. Do you want to explain it? Yeah, I just thought it was kind of relevant to the conversation of like getting some of those this information like out into the community which is um madison you probably already know about this but one of my friends robin helped um he does all the art displays at the book bin and, and he's an art student at osu and just does a lot of like community organizing and i know he partnered with um the cdc recently and helped um some of the the folks there create art to kind of represent their experience and their story and it got um you know displayed out um downtown and it was like and I thought that was a really cool way to like share the community without yeah um I just thought it was a really nice way to highlight those folks stories. Thanks, Cade, for sharing that. I actually had a slide on the book bin display that I worked with Robin on, um, but I took it out because I thought I wouldn't have enough time. But yes, so I'm so happy you brought that up because that is one way we have helped to showcase people in a way that they wanted to be showcased through their art. And that art was however they wanted to define it. And Robin was awesome. And we got a really cool display up for a whole month at the book bin. And he's continued to work with the CDBC as well. Thanks for that, Cade. We have time for one more question. Do any of our board members have other questions for Maddie about the work that SORT does or anything else? Okay, well, Maddie, thank you so much for your time. Um, and please share that PowerPoint with me and I'll include it. So it's posted to the HOPE website and I'll send it out to the board members so they can share it as well. Would you like me to share it as a PDF or a PowerPoint or both? PDF is better for some of our board members. Okay, sounds good. Thank you all so much. And all of you are doing great work too. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Maddie. Different work at different levels. Different work at different <laughs> levels, but it's all community. <laughs> We're in this together. Okay, well, thank you, Maddie. Um, I am going to let us take a three minute uh, bio break um, and rejoin at 5.06 um, to start the conversation of the uh, policy discussion. So return in three minutes at 5.06. Thanks folks.
All right, everyone, if you could please rejoin when you're able. And we can get back to your meeting and shift gears a bit here. Um, the rest of the meeting is dedicated um, to a policy discussion. Um, and so myself and Charles and Melissa Zavorin are going to give uh, some background on what's going on right now. Uh, what is this policy? Um, I'm going to give some background on what's going on with Benton County and the city of Corvallis collaborating uh, on a pilot to better coordinate homelessness and how that aligns with sustainable funding conversations. And Melissa is going to give some insight into IHN's role, their interest in this topic of sustainable funding and coordinated strategic funding for social services and housing. Uh, and then we'll open it up to you all to give feedback. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and screen share for just a second here um, for the visual learners like myself. Um, and really the purpose of the discussion for you all here tonight is not to dive into what should the social services funding policy be, but mu much more about um, what process should they take? What timeline should we look at? Um, and then from IHN's perspective, um, who should be included? Um, and what's the trajectory of this kind of um, discussion on strategic funding? So I'm gonna hand it over to Charles to talk about what the policy is, um, why the council's deliberating on it, uh, and then the goals of the discussion tonight from his perspective as a city councilor, and then we'll go to my portion and Melissa's, and then open it up for the full conversation. So Charles, take it away. All right, hopefully I won't have too much background noise. It's warm today, so my windows are open. <laughs> um, so on May 19th, the council had a work session and on that work session was the topic of social service funding. Um, they you know, wanted to, uh, council to provide direction to staff regarding our council policy 00-6.05 for those who wanna look it up. Um, over the years, workloads have gone allowed review for several years, uh, like since 2013. Um, and it's supposed to be reviewed every three years. So a long time has passed without reviewing our, our this policy. Um, and a few of the things that kind of spurred to bring this kind of forward finally um, was our recommendations of providing shelter and um, the city receiving a large one-time flexible spending amount of money. Um, they provided some information, the fact that things we already know, like Corvallis is one of the fastest growing cities um, and that uh, Corvallis is number one rent burden community in Oregon in 2021. You know, so we, we have some problems and a lot of other information, but you can, you can go back and review that work session. It's all online. You can see the whole thing. Um, since that time, I learned recently that, um, well, I knew about it, but knew about what the outcome was. Three counselors met unofficially, I wanna make that clear, um, with service providers to discuss some questions that they sent out ahead of time. Um, 13 providers were present, five providers that did not attend but answered the questions. I would have been there, but uh, like I stated earlier, sometimes my daytime job gets in the way of things. I was actually on a work trip to Bend. Um, but, um, they asked several questions. I can repeat those if you wanna know what they are. Uh, mainly discussed around the $360,000 levy and the CD, CDBG um, funding. They had a very powerful discussion. Um, one of the things I'd like to share that came out of that apparently is that providers and the few counselors that, that were there felt that this needs to happen more often. That you know, many people on council feel like we need more interaction with the people doing the work because getting it relayed through staff sometimes is a disconnect. Um, they do have a planned proposal uh, coming tomorrow's work session um, to have the levy stay with social service funding uh, direct sp specifically pro to provide services. Um, so tomorrow, on June 23rd, we'll have another work session, and the questions that are being asked for council to consider, um, um, mainly because during the last work session, several counselors um, indicated that they wanted to add housing to the social service policy. Um, so the questions are, are there items that the council wants to add, remove, and or better define? Does the council want to make the social service policy tied to services with housing specifically? Um, does council want to continue to have United Way administer the $360,000 of annual social service levy funding? And is there a better way to align the funding streams from the city? So the concerns that um, I raised uh, during our executive session, which kind of spawned this conversation, is one, I value the opinion of the HOPE Advisory Board. You know, a lot of great work has been done over the last couple of years, especially given COVID. So I, I think your opinion is more valuable than a lot of other opinions because you're the ones who are involved in this subject. 
Um, and the concern is if there's a shift in the the social the, the social service funding policy, is that going to negative have negative effects? You know, we we do acknowledge we need some brick and mortar. We need you know places for people to live and additional expanded. So, uh, sorry, busy work today and a lot of noise now. <laughs> you know, we do need additional shelter beds, but we you know at what cost? We want to make sure you know what your opinion is on. Like, like Julie already said, that moving forward, how should we be viewing things? And just want to hear your opinions on, you know, how should we address this? Is that covered, Julie? Yeah, I think so, Charles. And just wanted to be real clear about the Hope Board's role here. Um, it's not to make the decision on what to Ooh. fund. No. Uh, that... <laughs> Advisory board. <laughs> That's City Council's decision. Um, and this is more um, after I share and after Melissa shares. Um, trying to give Jan and Charles some feedback on the process to make this decision and the timeline right. to take on this decision. Yeah, basically, if, if you know, if I get information from you all and, and then Jan and I can take that and during our council discussion tomorrow, have that opinion and information, just, you know, what are we hearing to help guide our thought process? Okay, thanks for that, Charles. Any questions about the policy itself um, or city council's decision making on that before we give you some more information? Peggy, is that a question or just moving your hands? Okay. Um, I would like to quickly add, I, I spoke to a few constituents and they were concerned that that it was this, you reviewing this policy was like, policy was some sort of reactionary thing. And really, as I stated, we should have been reviewing this policy every three years and it's just, kept, you know, when things come up, things get put on the back burner, so to speak. So it's overdue. It does need to be reviewed and updated to what we need now. Thank you, Charles. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, so I wanted to provide an update and I know I've touched on this before, um, but there was a house bill at the Oregon State Legislature um, to fund eight different counties in Oregon as pilots. And so Benton County is one of those pilot areas and we're working collaboratively with the city of Corvallis. Um, and the goal of this funding and the requirements of this legislation are really to coordinate our response to homelessness, to communicate it in a coordinated way, um, and to utilize this state funding over the next two years um, on a coordinated homeless response. And one of the requirements of this pilot um, is to create a five-year strategic plan um, in about the next year. Uh, and one of the requirements in the five-year strategic plan uh, is to include um, ideas, thoughts, or plans on sustainable funding uh, for homelessness response and services. Uh, so what that really means is, you know, how are we in Benton County and the city of Corvallis uh, going to fund in a sustainable way? That means year after year. So uh, positions don't go away and locations don't go away. Uh, and that really aligns with what the city is uh, looking at right now. Um, how do they want to uh, provide a sustainable funding stream for specific services or brick and mortar or shelters? And so the city and the county staff are going to be working on coordinating on these efforts and putting together a strategic plan that includes sustainable funding. So just to round out the conversation on this topic. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Melissa. Melissa, why don't I just read the bullet points or would you like to read them? I know we have visual and auditory learners here. <laughs> what do oh, you prefer? Um, go, go ahead. I had kind of put my own notes together um, based on our conversation and emails back and forth. Um, I just go ahead and read them and I can add to in context. Okay, yeah, these were just bullet points I had sent out to you and Charissa. Um, Intercommunity Health Network, Coordinated Care Organization, IHNCCO. They are a Medicaid insurance company in the Tri-County area for folks who aren't familiar with them. Um, they have some upcoming capacity, that means like a staff person, um, to coordinate on the topic of strategic financial investments for social determinants of health, SDOH. And social determinants of health are things like housing. Um, and the role for IHN would focus around convening community partners, funders, providers, with the goal to be to map out what are all the funding streams in this area for things like social determinants of health, social services, like the people who help folks, and then shelter and supported housing, um, and coordinate 
how we strategically invest for our shared priorities and goals. Um, and the purpose of this work and this convening and mapping out would be to help funders like the city, like the county, uh, like private community foundations and the state um, coordinate how we fund on housing and social services so we can best leverage funding streams. For example, Medicaid can't pay for brick and mortar yet, but it can pay for lots of stuff. Um, the city has flexible funding streams that can pay for brick and mortar when lots of other ones can't. Um, so how can we as a community strategically coordinate how we fund our system of services and housing um, so that we aren't well, so that we're best leveraging the flexible funds and the more restricted funds. And then from your perspective, Melissa, the purpose of the discussion that comes next is who do we include and what's the trajectory of this work? And I'll stop screen sharing so people can see you when you flesh that out. Yeah, so I wanna add a little bit of um, context to that. IHNCCO, we are a health plan, but the wonderful thing about us being a coordinated care organization is, is we also have this whole breadth of work and commitment to population health and health equity. And in that we support a lot of social determinants of of health um, activities, efforts, initiatives, and there are several ways that we do that. Um, we can provide funding. Funding is limited in the grand scheme of things. Um, I can talk a little bit about that funding and those funding streams, but as Julie had said previously, we have, are very limited in what we can do for brick and mortar. There's only one little segment of funding that we can use, and it's a small percentage of our profits as a nonprofit organization <laughs> that we can use for that. And um, but we do have more money for health-related services that um, that we usually uh, divvy out to different organizations once a year uh, under pilot projects that are transformative um, in nature. Uh, and then, you know, we have a special bucket that we keep on the side for urgent things that come up throughout the year. Uh, so... But one of the major things that we do is we are a community convener. We work across a region, Lynn, Benton, and, and Lincoln counties. Um, and we are engaged with numerous partners because of the work we do in various spaces. And one of the things that we can help out with and sustainability uh, as well is paying for services. So if you build it, they come, we can help pay. Um, so that's, you know, one of our um, one of our goals with this work, though, is to be that type of convener. Um, and, you know, constantly we're getting requests, not just in housing, but in in every aspect, like, can you, can you help us fund this? Can you help us do research in this area? Can, can you uh, vet out this project for me and, and help us in, in some certain way? Uh, and we love to do that stuff. And we have a whole team that just loves to do that stuff. I know Teresa Young-White is on the line. I, I don't think she's um, on video, but she just wanted to follow along. And she's our community engagement manager and has been heavily devoted to work in the community and, and trying to provide funding and technical assistance. Um, we also have a desire to connect with our community uh, partners and help the flow of referrals. So we fund Unite Us um, as a system to do closed loop referrals. So we uh, have community-based organizations that do that between organizations, between um, our providers and also our care teams. And the, cap the capacity that we have, we're actually building a capacity for this that would be multi multifaceted. Um, and that individual could help track the funding streams, because as everyone is now thankfully getting more money flowing in to support this cause, um, it is kind of a, okay, how do we spend it? And you can spend it on a million things, but you have to think, because there's so many needs, but you have to think really strategically as to what, where are we going to get the most bang for the buck? How are we going to help the most people with this? 
and think about it for long-term successes. And, and so as we've seen all of this, we are more than happy to um, support the effort to kind of track what those funding streams are, what, what their intended use is, um, how long do you have to spend it, and who else's funding stream aligns with that. And if you're making investments, do you make investments in some areas of that funding um, priority um, collectively? So you're creating kind of an economies of scale effect in, in that funding. Um, so we would like to start that effort, um, likely beginning next month sometime. I think we'll be able to pull that together. And as Julie said, how we, we'd like to convene who needs to be at the table, who has this funding, who is willing to collaborate. And even if you don't have funding, is who's, who's best informed to, um, to help provide information for everyone and connect the dots. So um, yeah, I think there are three things that we kind of want to know, um, well, who needs to be involved? And it's not three things, it's just three types of, of individuals I'm thinking of. Um, so it's organizations, um, and I would say persons. Persons incorporates organizations. Um, so organizations that are receiving funding, organizations providing the services, and, and organizations or persons that can inform the conversations. So if we can start with a list of individuals, you know, trying to make sure it's not 50 people wide because we'll never make a decision. Um, but really trying to make sure we're inclusive. Um, I can start kind of mapping that list out. And it is also possible for you all to think about it a little bit and, and possibly email uh, myself and, and or Julie, and we can start to build that list and, and invite folks to the table. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share one last time to kind of define um, what the purpose of this discussion is for our HOPE board members. Um, so knowing that IHN has some capacity to convene and coordinate funders and providers on this topic, uh, knowing that the city and the county are part of a pilot wanting to tackle this, what are some possible paths or timelines or processes for city council to move forward on this topic? Um, so sharing your thoughts as HOPE board members on immediate decision making to update the social services funding policy um, or taking more time for a collaborative and coordinated process um, with the support of IHN to convene and map out funding and funders. Um, and then interspersed in there, who should be included in this process that IHN is going to move forward with. Um, and then from Jan and Charles perspectives, uh, the purpose of the discussion is so that they can help inform their process or timeline for decision making on this topic and for IHN to help inform their coordination efforts. So I'll go ahead and stop screen sharing and ask board members who have not spoken yet tonight, do you want to chime in on this? What are your thoughts on it? You all have fantastic thoughts. I know you do. Julie, just uh, pointing to you a question that Carol asked in the chat. Thank you for drawing my attention to that. Carol, do you want to um, share this verbally? Sure, I mean, I can. I, I've been on budget commission for nine years. And, uh, and in that time, the, the discussion often gets into uh, the city should own, if we're talking about general funds, uh, the city should fund police, fire, and public works. Those are the basic services. That's what the city's about. And then it's always been a struggle to get funding for parks and, and libraries, anything that's considered by some people, and, and including some counselors in the past, um, non-essential services. There's also been discussion uh, in those some, sometimes that social service funding was great when the city had um, more money, but that's really the role of the county 
and it's not the role of the city. I, I don't particularly agree with any of this, but this has been something that has come up off and on. And so I was interested in from, from Jan and Charles point of view, given this current council, um, what, where, where do you think the council is on this? I mean, the budget commission uh, is typically it's citizens, not council, it's council and citizens. And it's a recommendation body, but the decision making is the city council. So no matter what the budget commission says, if city council says we're going to fund this, we are. But I wanted to hear from them what their sense is about where the city is on this. Thanks, Carol. Charles? Um, that's a tough one, really. Um, I wouldn't say that the their um, their their essential funding has not changed. You know, the general view is still the minimum necessities to keep the city city functioning and providing services that are you know necessary, such as fire and police. Um, however, you know, I feel the discussion amongst counselors is always shifting. It's it's always moving. It ebb and flows. And lately, you know, there is a lot of discussion over trying to think of long term solutions on you know this specific issue. So. It's hard to say until you get into a, a budget discussion, but you know other councilors have expressed the desire to have funding for, you know, housing and shelter needs. So, uh, Jan, if you have anything to contribute to that, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> well, I think most people are aware that a city, like any government organization, is always looking for for funding. Uh, we actually have had to. Uh, create fees for uh, police and fire that are outside of the, the general fund. And, um, and with those, uh, you know, for street fees, we have, uh, as an example, we have a safety fee. As an example, we have the 911 district, uh, which is a tax, actually a bond. So we are not able to do our um, essential services with with the tax money and the that we get for running the city. We do have to charge extra fees. And therefore we do have a levy and that levy, the livability bond is what it was called for the last uh, three phases of this, uh, uh, provides uh, services for Osborne, the library, Majestic Theater, those sorts of things. And it also does of course have the social services component to that. Um, and then we also have the, um, we get HUD money and that's for the block grants and 15% uh, of that goes to social services, direct homeless social services. Our main strength is developing housing and developing code to develop housing, uh, to find means and avenues to promote affordable housing. So I think that's, that's our strength at this point we're not a social service. Um, we are a funder, and and we can we can try. You know, that's I think that's the goal here. We have a lot of other things that the city has to do, and um, we're um, trying to come up with ways to pay for those. So the um, I guess you could say that um, as as best that we can do, we can we have staff that can leverage state and federal funds that can funnel state and federal funds and can funnel um, levy and, and bond funds to social services. Um, and, and I think that's, like I said, that's our, that's our strength, but, but we, it's, it's, it is limited. Yeah, no, I would, you. I would add to that if it's all right, real quick. Um, you know, each counselor has their own point of view. I have a different point of view than, than, than Jan and, you know, it's, that's fine. That's why we have nine counselors. Um, you know, I do think the city could potentially have a role in being more involved with social services, but still on kind of the back end. You know, I mean, we the city currently owns property that it leases out to affordable housing for pennies on the dollar, uh, I think is what 100 units up in north the north part of town. So it's not unheard of for the city to own property to be able to, you know, basically provide it for free nearly. Uh, to guarantee affordable housing. So, I mean, the city could take a different position and obviously within the budget process, which, you know, I would love to see more public participation in that, providing opinions, um, 
someone could always make a motion and things could change drastically and you never know. It doesn't usually happen, but it could. Well, so can I, and it is the council's decision. Thanks, Charles and Jan. I just want to make sure to circle back to the purpose of the feedback from you all tonight. Um, you know, council um, was set to make decisions on this in the next month or so. Um, but knowing that IHN is going to be going forward with strategic mapping out of funding, and that the city and the county are also going to be look at looking at um, strategic sustainable funding for homelessness services, is there feedback that you all have as a diverse section of community members for our city councilors here um, about making this decision next month um, or waiting and um, utilizing this process and a longer timeline? Um, Andrea and then Cindy. I think that this amount of money is um, well utilized by all of the different groups that apply for the funding. The decision-making process, I don't think should be held up for you know, what the work that, that Samaritan will do on mapping out funding. I feel like whatever happens with homelessness is gonna be separate actually from the social services pot or it might be in addition to it. And so I don't feel like I, I've had varying thoughts about this, but I feel like the, I think the council should move forward. Cindy. Okay, and Peggy, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take, take a slightly different tactic on that and say that I think that the, the city needs the information that IHN, IHN and CCO are pulling together. And in looking at Carol's, going back to Carol's question, which I think is very pertinent to this, I look at those essential services of police, fire, and public works, and there is a large impact on those services and money that is spent um, because of the impacts of houselessness in the community. So it seems like they all go together, that there, there's, a, there, there's such an impact there that that area really needs to be looked at as a, as a whole. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Peggy, you raised your hand. Yeah, thanks. So I love it that Samaritan is um, going to be doing this mapping, going to be um, helping us think about this. I feel like the work um, that the city and county staffers are doing with CSC in talking about, you know, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, here's how we foresee what's going to happen in the future. I think all that's important. And I think the work that HOPE is doing and has done is super important. Uh, having said all that, what worries me is that if some um, decisions are not made with the information that we've already put a substantial amount of time into developing through the HOPE process, um, that we lose some momentum. And frankly, it is disheartening to me that if those recommendations and if the huge amount of public input that we've gathered isn't utilized in formulating some of these decisions, um, it feels like we're just right back to where we've started previously. We've had multiple iterations of this work, hoping that if we talk about it long enough, we can figure out how to exactly solve the issue. And each time we come down to this point where it's like, unless we're willing to put this all into place and really use this information to drive decision-making on um, social services spending, we're not gonna be able to get there. We're not gonna be able to resolve it. And I love, love, love what Cindy said about that um, many of those public investments, the, um, the public infrastructure that we have is being impacted by houselessness and the blowback and the outfall of people who are unhoused. And so if we should, if we were investing in this money at the front, investing at the front end to prevent some of these issues, I, I, just, I just see that as a, as a well thought out approach. And I would certainly hope the city would be taking it into account. Thank you, Peggy. Catherine. 
there are some amazing perspectives and wisdom <laughs> being shared here in this space. And I really appreciate everybody's um, willingness to share in those thoughts. I'm going to just throw this out there. Um, I, I see both sides of this discussion. I feel like we need to be responsive to the work that HOPE has done, the needs that are occurring right now. Um, but I'm hesitant to say, let's just make that decision holistically with this Corvallis Supportive Services funding. Because if we're looking at a five-year strategic planning that has to do with Benton County and City of Corvallis funding, then we really need to include our Benton County partners in this conversation alongside with the city council decisions in the city of Corvallis. I don't think they operate independently of one another, um, especially when we look at the pilot program funding and dollars. So my question is, is there a way for the Corvallis city council to um, take a stepped approach to this uh, review for their supportive services? Can we make decisions that are occurring right now based on real-time data that is happening right now that we've collected the recommendations that have been provided, knowing that there's a strategic planning process occurring and underway, and maybe not commit everything in this first phase, but look to commit over a period of, of time or a series of phases that include, so I would say that Benton County, when we look at homelessness, is not just Corvallis. And I know we know this, but it's just important to be reminded of well, what about in Philomath? How are we gonna extend these services to Philomath? And I can speak from Philomath, but I'll speak for Adair Village also. How are we going to extend these services and this pilot program and these dollars and the HOPE recommendations to LC or Kings Valley or Adair Village or Monroe, right? So, so is there a way that we can do both, right? So we've got um, two things happening at the same time. One is immediate responsiveness and one is a long range planning that involves um, a more Benton County comprehensive approach. Thanks for that perspective, Catherine. I always appreciate it when you reiterate that. Um, Andrea, you put a couple things in the chat. Did you wanna share them verbally for oh, folks who I can't don't see the actually. chat? This really fires me up. And if you wanna <laughs> read what I have to say about this, read the chat because this is a distraction from really looking at other resources that the city may have access to of shifting our priorities. And I'm really tired of, of being distracted by this conversation with city social services funds. All right. Other folks who are service providers, who are service providers here, Chanel, Anita, Cade, any perspective from your service provider point of view? And how about our um, first responders and law enforcement, Brian or Joel? Do you have any thoughts on this process? I I don't at this time. Let, I, I'll need to think about it and I'll get back to it. I would just say that without knowing all the details and the moving parts that if there's an opportunity to have somebody else do a lot of the legwork to find out the best path forward, um, that seems like a logical path to take. Can I ask a question um, of Charles and Jan? Um, and Nancy, maybe you know this answer too. Um, is there a possibility for making an update in the near term based on the HOPE recommendations, based on what we know now, um, with that sense of urgency um, that these funds are here now, with the flexibility to update it again in a year or a year and a half after IHN um, has gone through this process of convening and mapping out funding? I don't see why not. I mean, nothing stops council from reviewing any policy at any time. Um, this has just been brought forward because it's been neglected and pushed back. But I mean, if, if the council sees this as a priority because of new information or new services or new needs, I mean, yeah, at any time the council could just say, we want to review our policy and make changes. Well, and realistically wanting to respect staff time of my city colleagues, um, is this a huge, huge lift um, to change this again in a year, year and a half after there's maybe more information about strategic mapping? Yeah. Well, I can't speak to staff's availability or workload, 
Um, but part of the reason why it was put off was staff's workload that was in the mentioned in the packet for the work session. But still, even with that, I mean, in the end, anything that the council decides is a priority, it's a priority, you know, at any time. There might be some pushback from staff, and that's understandable. I understand they have a hard job to do. Um, but really, if, if the council votes, makes a motion and agrees that this is a priority, it, it's a priority and it gets done. So that's, that's my opinion. Okay, <laughs> and that's thanks. how it's supposed to work. Um, there was one thing in the chat from Ari. Um, do you want to share that um, from your perspective outside of Corvallis? That it makes sense that you know there are a lot of other communities that are involved, and so how how do the communities fit in with this? As Catherine was saying, because um, it's just not Corvallis; it's not an, uh, an isolated thing. So uh, you know we cover all of Benton County. So how does this you know fit with that concept? That's it. Thanks, Ari. I mean, the, the city council is looking at how they utilize funding streams really in Corvallis. Um, and then IHN, and Melissa, I'll go to you in just a second. You know, they cover all of Benton County and the tri-county area. Um, so I think what I'm hearing from um, Ari and also Catherine for you, Melissa and Charissa, um, is to be inclusive of our providers and partners and smaller cities outside of Corvallis as you go through this funding mapping. Um, so that those funding streams and uh, service providers are included too. Do you have time for a quick comment? I wanted to agree with, with Charles. Yes, the, the city council is de facto the governing body of the city. And if they want to make a spending priority, then they, they certainly can. It is the competing priorities that we have to look at and, and one of the things that I do would like to point out was that because of the CARES funding that was funneled through the city and the ARPA funding that was funneled through the city, uh, we did, I think our, our social services did receive um, a, a few million at least in, in distributed funds that, that were you know, stepped through our organization. And now that we have um, Paul Bellotta and Brigida working together on, on uh, a, a strategic uh, aspects of, of how to fund these organiza social services organizations. I think, I think we're, we're, we, we have made some strides there. So um, I'm, I would like to talk with uh, a couple of you one-on-one -on -one if, if that's okay, just give me a call, I know I can call you back too. Thanks, Jan. Um, Melissa is a vor and I saw your hand up um, and then Nancy. Oh, Melissa, you are muted. I think I got it. Can you hear me? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I was clear and that IHNCCO, yes, we are, are a regional organization. We work with all communities across Lincoln, Benton, and Lynn counties. And so um, to that end, this is not going to be just a, a Benton County effort or, or looking at one city in particular. It will be an effort to track all the funding streams we can related to housing and social Melissa, your your audio just went out at housing and social services. Now you're uh, okay. Um, but in any event, you know, tracking those those funding streams, what they can be used for, the timeline to spend them. Um, so so having that all as a collective, and then we can really think about what are what are individual organizations' goals and. And one of those is the Hope Board, right? And and it's it's you know developed based on a ton of input from a ton of different people and organizations. And and no, we shouldn't lose that, but we also um, shouldn't stay siloed to just one area's um, goals either. We do need to think about the community as a whole and and when we're making our decisions so i think it'll all be very supportive 
and you can all, whoever has the funding, make their final decisions. But I think that information that we collect and the strategic discussions that we have together will help inform those decisions. Thanks, Melissa. Nancy. Thank you. Um, I was just gonna share, I mean, I'm, I'm not a city councilor. I haven't been a city councilor in a year and a half. If I was a city councilor, I would be concerned at the thought of trying to come back in a year or two to update it again, just based on the history of, you know, the city's pace with updating these, you know, the current city manager, when he came in, I don't even know, six, seven years ago, one of his um, goals was to get all of the um, policies updated. And as we've seen, that is barely happened. I mean, it's been very slow to the point when, when I was still a city councilor, he brought in outside um, help to work on this because it is such a big workload. And this is not a critique on the part of the city manager, by the way, I'm just saying that it's a heavy lift. And as Jan said, there's always lots of competing priorities. Um, and yes, hypothetically, five counselors could decide in a couple of years that it's a big enough deal to come back to, but that's an if, and you, you know, things get lost. So that's just my two cents. Thanks, Nancy. Other input on this process, this timeline, city council moving ahead with updating this policy or pausing um, to look at the process that IHN is going forward with. Really just your thoughts to share with Jan and Charles who will ultimately be making this with their other city councilors. Well, I'd just like to add, even tomorrow's work session is we don't make final decisions in work sessions. They're for discussion, to give staff an idea of what's the direction council wants to go, but it, you know the final thing would be brought back to council for a vote. And of course, you know, that's open to public participation. So, you know, if you think of something, have other comments, suggestions, you can email the council, um, that's easily done, or even sign up to give testimony at a council meeting. I encourage public participation. Thanks for that, Charles, good reminder. Um, Peggy has had to leave uh, to get to a meeting in Salem and Melissa's video is off, but her audio is still working just so folks know. Any other insights or feedback or questions? Or input for Melissa and Charissa at IHN as they move forward, looking at how to convene funding partners strategically. I think it's great that, that, we're, that you guys are looking strategically at that because we are definitely, my, my biggest concern is we're gonna see a huge drop off in services after ARPA funding goes away because we literally have grown a system that we have to sustain somehow. And I can't imagine taking away what we've been able to accomplish. It's very worrisome. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and Melissa is a Voren. Um, we have requests to put your email in the chat, but I'm guessing that you can't chat right now if you're just on the phone. Would you like me to copy and paste your email? I have it ready. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I, I actually had it ready, Julie. I was just going to do it. So. Great. Thank you, Charissa. <laughs> For folks who don't know, Charissa is a powerhouse who works at IHN um, and knows quite a few folks in this community and coordinates and pulls people together um, and is working on care coordination like FUSE um, and also this topic um, of sustainable funding. Um, she's a joy to work with, so I'm glad you could be here tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. I'm happy to be here. All right, any last thoughts on this or input or questions to come back? Well, Charles and Jan, you got a lot of feedback tonight. Yeah, I'd like to add, I really love these group conversations. I think it, you know, it makes you think differently. It's very really helpful. I okay. agree. Thank oh. you. Thank you, Jan. Um, last screen share here. 
Um, for next steps, um, the research and the data work groups are going to continue to meet um, with updates that I shared for you. The July HOPE meeting, um, the educational component is going to be from IHN. We will welcome Melissa and Charissa back again um, about their structure, their services. What is the work that they do on population health that goes beyond their covered members? Um, and this work on the social determinants of health, like housing or sustainable funding streams. And then hopefully in August, um, we'll have Andrea and hopefully Sean Collins um, come talk about Housing First, the work that's going on at the Third Street Commons uh, and progress from those perspectives. And then in September, I'm hoping to invite folks from our community health centers that are county community health centers, they're federally qualified health centers. They serve um, the uninsured population. They serve folks um, who can't get care in a lot of other ways and areas. Um, and they do overlap with people experiencing homelessness in a variety of ways um, that are separate from uh, and in addition to what IHN and Samaritan do. I think that was it. Yes, I will stop screen sharing. Are there any other questions that came up from today or um, things you'd like the executive committee to consider going forward this summer? You follow up with Maddie about ways to make the sort information. So that's in your court. It is, and I'll probably just CC you on the email, Carol, so that you can get all of the info you'd like for the League of Women Voters uh, group. Yeah, and I don't know that doing a league program is the best. I, the, the idea of newspaper stuff was pretty powerful too, so I don't have a horse in this race. I just want to get it out there. But you're at the track every time. <laughs> Thanks for showing up to keep working on this. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm not seeing any other questions or thoughts. So thanks for the robust discussion. And Jan and Charles I, and Melissa and Teresa, I hope you got uh, what you were hoping for. And Could I'll I be sure. Non-hope question. Sure, Carol. I, um, I, re I review grants for Oregon Community Foundation. I did a review of a, the health, health center here. And one of the questions I asked was, uh, about grant funding. And this is something maybe Nancy, if she's still here or, or Julie could help me with. Um, the information I had was the county is a sovereign entity and therefore cannot go after nonprofit grants versus uh, other like OSU is a nonprofit and it goes after grants. And so I've been trying to find somebody who can if I know if this is true, the, the the person I was speaking with was saying, well, they can't they can't go after matching grants because they're part of the county and the county you can't they're not considered a nonprofit. So I don't know if you know that or if Nancy knows that or if somebody could because it, it'll actually show up when we in the August meeting, I think. I, I don't know that I can ask and see Did what I can find, find out. out. Because I would yeah, I would guess that it might depend on the grant. You know, it might not be a one size fits all answer. No, all this, was, this was like like um, the city can go after grants, and the, as a the OSU goes after grants as a nonprofit, and this was could could this could the clinic the health clinic that's associated with a county go after Ford Foundation grants or other grants, and and the question was where the county is sovereign, and so we don't have. Um, 5093C status, so we can't do that. So yeah, that would be great because nobody seems to know. I, Thanks, I Carol. Thanks for taking up the time for that. No, that's okay. I'm going to meet with our CHC folks in the next month to talk about their educational presentation in September. So this is a question that I can ask them. They were the ones asking me. Okay, then I'd Nancy. Rather, if, you not, if you if you could not, because it was really part of a conversation that's understand if Nancy and I can figure out the answer um, yeah. for, through administrative means we will follow up with you Carol either way excellente thanks of course thanks everyone we will see you next month have a good night everybody enjoy the first day of real summer in Oregon <laughs> I'm so glad the sun's out <laughs> yeah. oh, man. thank hot. you so much bye-bye thanks bye. everyone bye. take care 
Paula, do you have everything you need from the chat and everything else? Okay, great. You have a good night. Good to see you.